All right, you want to see the second one? <laughs> that got recorded too, so you guys are. Can I not turn that on? <clears throat> there we go. All right, so set number two on the second batch of problems. It was strict. I thought I set it up right, but apparently. All right, well, tell me what you did. I did 10 times 1 minus D over 4. Times one plus point oh six over two plus twenty times one plus point oh six over two to the thirty. Okay, and why did you set it up I that way? Wrong, so. Well, tell me why. Tell me what you were thinking. Well, have you read the problem? Yeah. Well, I think it's that timeline thing. Is your timeline thing? Okay. Hey, I found Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> the door was the door was locked. I didn't I did not lock it. I mean I shut it, but I did not lock it. But I wave at Jenny. Alright, so you did the timeline thing. What what thing did you do? I labeled it zero times fifteen to thirty. Okay. Okay. And at zero, we had 10. Okay. At 15, we had 20. And okay. At 30, we had 100. Okay. But at 10, it switches from uh, a discount to a Okay. So that was why you did this one, right? Yeah. Okay. I did that right. Well, it looks like you did it right. Does it, everybody, others think that Grace did it correctly? I had a, I had a different. I had a, a one minus D over. In the denominator? Okay, so why it was in the denominator? I figured since it was, since you switched from, uh, switched from that to interest, you should have it. I... Okay, so remember, that you're, yeah, you're right. The discounting, remember, it's always based off of your accumulated value when you're doing the discounting. So I think the only thing that you had wrong was that should be a negative sign in your exponent. Negative. Yeah. Gosh darn it. That's not my so that was why you that was why you were having an issue. Yeah, it should be a minus forty there. Will it always be negative with a discount? It's always a negative. It's, both of those signs will be negative. Well, this one's always negative. But they'll both be negative if you're working on the front side. Yeah, so everything was set <coughs> Wow, sorry. Everything was set up right except for that negative exponent. You should be able to get the answer to that one. Okay, can we? Well, I can't. <laughs> Are we okay with the setup for number two? I mean, I'm going to assume you can solve it now with the algebra. Number five. What'd you do at number five? Well, I did a little timeline thingies. Okay, timeline thingies. One for Brian and one for Jennifer? Yeah. Okay. So what did you label? Um, zero to ten for both of those. Okay. And then put an X over both of those zeros. Okay. 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 Plus 
plus one half I two. Okay. I think I, pro I probably I'm going to just give it a different name for the time being. I'll call it J. Okay. And then. I see what I did. I think it's J. Okay. I think it's J. No. Okay, so you did it. So you know that your J2 is Jennifer's is exactly half of Brian's. So that'd be 2i. Right? Jennifer's is, Jennifer's is half of Brian's. So I got that equation set. Yeah, it should be 2, right? <clears throat> and it makes sense because Brian's paying back more than Jennifer, so Brian better have the higher interest rate. So this becomes, if I use the same idea here, then this becomes 1120, then one, ugh, 1 plus 2i, 2 to the 20th? Uh, just i, sorry. 1 plus i, 2. I hate that notation, maybe thinking squaring. That was, why, that was why I did that. It was maybe thinking squaring the two. So now you should be able to set those two equal to each other and solve for i, I hope. Yeah. Okay, Oh, no, that's a problem. <laughs> Are we okay with this one, how this one's set up? Because at this point, they're both borrowing x, so you should set both of those equal to each other and solve for i. Which isn't horrible. I mean, that's what I said, but it's not horrible. I'm asking because I want to scroll up. I don't want to mess up anybody. Yeah. For this same number, um, for some reason I use this value, but um, I'm, is it possible to do that? So doing what? What? Tell me what you did. So rather than multiplying with, oh, you wrote this is eight hundred v to the twentieth. Oh, you did it like this? So, I, I this is okay to set it up this way. How did you get this one? Is it doubled, though, in that case? Do we know? Yeah, and I'm not sure it is, because remember you've got your um, your formula for D is, well, writing it this way, what do we know about D? D is 1 over 1 plus I, right? So if I double my interest, I'm not going to double the discount, so that's going to cause an issue. I think I, you can do it with the discounts, but I don't know if you'll have... You'll have that exact thing. Yeah. I think it's easier to do with the interest in that case. Okay, Grace. Can you move money forward and backward with this count? Yeah. Yep. This is it's just a matter of what, what, where do you have your exponent? Is it positive or negative? I mean. So why is there a difference between this count and this count? Like, why is this count even a thing? Why is it a thing? Is that what you just asked me? Like, if you could solve all of the like the regular interest rates without using discount, then why? Remember, for the notation purposes, when we start moving money backward, we think about discounting it from accumulated to the present value, and it makes the notation a little bit simpler. So typically, when you're going backwards, typically you use, you're using the discount, right? In this case, I mean, I could write it as. V or whatever, if you wanted to, just a matter of your V will be different because it's different uh, 
Um, six on the first page. Okay, so six has, you haven't, well, what did you do? I guess I should ask it that way first. Uh, I set them equal to each other at two years. Okay. So I got one on the left side for x is 100 times 1.5j times two. So it's 100 times, say that again? 1.05j. That's the interest rate, right? So that would give you the amount of interest. So I think you got to do 1 plus 1.05j to get your accumulated value times 2. All right, because if I just do the 1.05j times 2, that's just going to give me the amount of interest. So I've got to add back on the, the 100. And so then for the right-hand side, you would have what? Add 100. Uh, multiply one plus a squared. Okay, cool. Yeah, so that's probably why you were getting a complex value for the interest rate. Right? That should that should help. <laughs> and this, so at this point, you need to figure out what the j is, and then do what a hundred times one plus j in the fifth. Value Other questions? Yeah. yeah. Back to number five, okay? Yeah, so how many like I would not round. I would leave them in your calculator, and it wouldn't round until the very end. Okay. <laughs> what, what is the actual answer for that? I don't know. I didn't do the problem. <laughs> I mean, if you give me a calculator, I'll do it right now. But <laughs> You should, what will your equation be? It'll be 800 over 1120 is equal to 1 plus i2 over 2. To the 20 other one plus i plus i is equal to the 20th root, and then one plus. Or just add the root. First, I had a rounding error and I got non many answers. And then I fixed that rounding error and I got one of the answers. Sydney rounded to a different answer and got a different answer. So. I go. Here. You should have 800 over 1120 is 1 plus i over 2 to the 20th over 1 plus i of the 20th. Just immediately five yeah. yeah, so then I need to take the 20th root, so I get 1 plus, oh, hey, 1 plus i2 over 2 over 1 plus i is equal to about 0 0.001195. Yeah? Okay. So we get 1 plus i2 over 2 is 0 0.0195. Oops, 1195. And then that's the same thing times i. So if I subtract that from 1, and then. Subtract that from 1, so move this to the other side. So I have 1 minus that point zero zero uh, zero one one nine five. And then I need to divide that by the point zero zero one nine five plus, or excuse me, minus a half. What did I do wrong here? Why am I getting, getting a negative, I think, <laughs> which doesn't make any sense. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. What did I do wrong here? 
I took the 20th root. Let's try this again. 800 divided by 11 to 70 to the, oh, I didn't take the 20th root. I multiplied it to the 20th power. That was my problem. That would be y. Sorry. To the 1 divided by 20. Try that again. This is 0.9833 that makes more sense. Okay, try that again. One minus that answer, and then divided, and then the answer minus 0.5. So I get I is about 0 0.0345. Yeah. Okay. So that should be your semi. I didn't. I didn't. I got rid of the ex. Uh, the uh, superscripted notation. So that should be your semi-annual interest rate. Right. So then I need to use either of our previous formulas to figure out what x is. So then if I take that interest rate divided by two. I would not round it. I would leave your calculator that way. So divided by two, add one, I need to raise that to the negative 20 of power and then multiply that by your 1120. You get 795? Is that one of the answers? No. No, okay. Well, that's nice. All right, so. That's yeah, it happens. It happens. It's fine. It, we'll figure it out. One minus the answer divided by the answer minus a half. Okay, so that's the semi-annual interest rate. Oh, I divided it by two. I didn't want to do that. Plus one raised to the negative 20th and then times the 11 20. 568? 568? Yeah. Okay, cool. I rounded the interest rate, so that's why I got to do it. I, I, I used the wrong formula to do that. I used the wrong present value. That was what I did wrong. Real ones, too. But yes, my suggestion would be don't round in the middle. <laughs> I don't know what you mean by easy ones. I mean, they can make them hard. We started with these. Well, the formula needs to get more complicated, but I don't think the problem is. I honestly don't think the problems get more difficult. You just get more stuck. Because it's the same, they'll ask you the same kinds of questions later on, it's just going to be a different context. So I don't, I don't think anything's getting any more difficult because it's just more complicated because you have more stuff. You'll have more formulas, more things with your calculator, and those kinds of things. I don't think they get harder. I think it's just get more. Don't get discouraged. Too early in the semester to get discouraged. You look discouraged, so I guess you could use that with tired. It's okay. I didn't know I was a bad you guys think you would tell me that, I think. Yeah. You wouldn't guess, you would just know. Yeah, I would just know. <laughs> Good question. I think we're six on that second page, too. Well, I got like 3,000. That's not what all the answers Number six on the second one. Jennifer deposits that one? Yeah. Okay. Jennifer's giving me a lot of <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer needs to calm down. So that's what I'm hearing. All right, well, so what did you set up? Where did I start? Yeah. OK, so the sheet deposits 1,000. The first, the first like, seven years would be like the 1 plus i2 over 2 to the 14th, right? OK. Plus, like, yeah, one plus two i over four. Or like not two plus i four over four. 
Yep. To the authority Yeah. Yep. Oh, you did. You did four T. That's what you're saying. So you put your T is in years. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Uh, and then Okay. Oh, a thousand times one plus I two over two to the fourteenth times one plus I two over two to the fourteenth as well. And how, why is it 14? Because it's the grand half times 4. There's, it's three and a half years of being compounded quarterly. So there's 14 quarters in three and a half years. So that's why that exponent should be 14. So just to uh, emphasize that this 14, there's 14 quarters in 3.5 years. That's where the 14 is coming from. So you convert it to 1 plus i, plus i over 2, which is 28. Yep, I agree. So you get 1.98. Oh my heavens. 1.98 is 1 plus i2 over 2 to the 28th. So if you go through all of that mess, your i2 should be. Actually, when I did I two over two, because I'm gonna need to plug that back in anyway. I two over two is gonna be what? I need to take one point nine eight, and I need to do it to the one twentieth power, and subtract one. So I get I two over two is point zero three four seven. What did I do? The twentieth root? Is that what I said? Yeah. Oh my goodness! One point nine eight to the it was twentieth root was last problem, wasn't it? Yeah. All right, minus one. I get zero point zero two four seven for i two over two. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you had a weird look on your face. I'm like, did I do it wrong again? <laughs> It's just I. Just the I. I'm, I'm leaving it as I2 over 2 because I need to plug it back into the formula. Yeah. They're not. The second formula is quarterly. It's, it looks like semi annually because of the 2 and the 4. That's what helps you actually solve the problem. It looks, it looks like it's. So then I need to add one and I need to raise that to the tenth power, to the ones that they really value after five years. So raise it to the tenth power, so you should get 1276. Yeah, that's what I got. I said that 1275. Yeah, it's called Yeah, so take the closest. Yeah, great. Yeah. Is that eight? The twenty above here. No, it's the two gamma power. The two gamma power. That <laughs> one okay? So your X that they're asking you to do, your X is gonna be the one plus I two over two to the tenth. Because it's asking you for five years, and in that case, you're doing semi annual compounding. So that's why we're going to get approximately 1276.30. And in these problems, sometimes you will get values that are slightly off, but it should be slightly off of what the answers they give you. But it should be clear which one you're supposed to select. Should be.
Thank you for it. So if it's $1 off, is that okay? $1 off. Other questions? Where do you think it's going? I don't know. I'm always willing to listen to, for, to feedback. Whether or not I pay attention to it is my call, but. Do you want to work more of these problems or are you ready to go on to new stuff? New stuff? Kelly says new stuff. I think we should work some more of these problems. You want to work some more of these problems? Well, you've got the flip side, right? Hey, Kevin. I can, yeah, I can do that. What's the new stuff? Yeah. Yeah, tell us and then we'll see if you want to work. Force of interest? Force? Force, yeah. You gotta use the force. <laughs> All right, let's learn some new stuff. That sounds better. Oh, for heaven's sake. <laughs> it is. There's a little calculus. It's a little, little calculus. It's all right. Everybody loves limits. Do we use to approximate these? No, you know this answer. I'm saying you have to do it. This is E. Yeah. E to the what? What? N. N. Uh, I would have said e to the first, but I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> e to the, it's e to the i, yeah. Oh. <laughs> we learned this today. In whatever class that is. Count three? Yeah. Negative i pi. Either the i pi is negative one. E to the negative i pi is also negative one. They're both negative one. All right. So this is a limit that you did back in Calgary in Calc 3, right? You apparently did it this morning if you were in Calc 3, or at least talked about it. Uh, if you really wanted to re-derive the limit, you would take the log, you log to make a fraction, you log to L's rule, get an answer. How often are you going to have to find how to do that kind of stuff? Like this? Yeah, like take limits and stuff. Because I don't know how to do it. You want to do it? So you're telling me you want to do it? No, no, I don't. I still have my calc free notebook. I mean, I can buy you some lamps. She's like, it's not going to happen. It's not nice. I figured that was something that sounded like something you would say, though. It is something I would do, but <laughs> As far as actually doing limits, probably not very often. I wasn't doing a limit here. I was trying to remind you of something. <laughs> I wasn't actually going to do the limit. I can. It's also in your textbook. They do it for you. That's okay. I have no idea. I have it. It came in the mail last week. <laughs> I didn't know where we were running all right, anyway, what was I doing? What was I doing? All right, so th this is number of compounding periods in a year, and I did it for one year, right? So this would be your accumulation factor for one year. If you're doing what's called, com this is typically called compounding continuously, but this is where the force of interest comes from. Right? Yeah, that's the PERT thing. Yep, sure is. PE to the RT for continuously compounded interest at a rate of R. It's the PERT thing, yeah, it is the PERT thing. So if this is, if I wanted to go for T years, I could raise this to the teeth power, right? Make it N times T, right? We agree? Which would raise this side to the T power, or you would just get E to the I T. 
So in this case, for continuously compounded interest, of course, make that noise. Continuously compounded interest um, at a rate. Now it depends on what you look at. Your textbook uses a little r, which is um, for that for when it wants fourth of interest or this continually continuously compounded interest. A lot of books use the uh, Greek letter delta rather than a r. You'll notice in a lot of the example problems that we do, we'll have deltas in there instead of r's. Just know that you it, it should say fourth of interest regardless. Or continuously compounded interest, it's grace. Well, it's not a use for you, Doesn't bother me as long as I know what you're talking about. So the accumulation factor here, or accumulating factor, I can't remember which one, it, well, which word the book uses, will be e to the delta t. Or if you use a little r, you would have e to the r t. And so if you've got a present value or initial principle of t, if you've seen a continuously compounded interest formula before in a college algebra text or a finite math text, you usually see it as p times e to the r t for continuously compounded interest. The reason why they call it continuously compounded is because we're letting the number of compounding periods per year go to infinity. So it becomes continuously compounded, and it doesn't make it grow infinitely. It becomes, it settles down and becomes a finite factor for your interest, like your interest for your rate of growth. So from this formula now, we're going to have another idea for a conversion formula. So remember, your accumulation factor For an annual effective rate of i is just 1 plus i, right? Uh, and then raised to the t power, correct? If you have an annual effective rate of i for t years, your accumulation factor is just 1 plus i is t. So if we want the we want if we want to think about equating these things, if I want to have a conversion that goes from annual effective to force of interest and vice versa, if I can think about equating these after one year, and we've done this before with equivalent compounding rates or compounded interest versus compounded discount setting them equal for a year, right? Same idea. If we do this for a year, you get the formula e to the delta is equal to 1 plus i or delta is natural log of 1 plus i. So this formula will pop up in examples now I printed off a bunch of problems that had a bunch of stuff with fourth of interest and it promptly left them on the copier before I walked downstairs. So I don't have those with me, but let's see if I can find one in one of the problems here that we talked about last time. Actually, if you pull out your big packet, we should have one with fourth of interest in there. Yeah, the big the thick packet, yep. To be the thing. So these are the exercises for chapter four. By the way, this was all of that is the lecture for chapter four, by the way. That's it? That's it. Now we're gonna do more stuff with force of interest, but we're gonna do varying force of interest. This is constant force of interest. What is that? That means that we're gonna do an integral. <laughs> Woo! -hoo! <laughs> Woo -hoo! More calculus, I know. It's great. Oh, in the next section, you'll trick us. You'll like have us take the Taylor series. Oh, well, we will talk about Taylor series in this class too. No, we're not going to do any tricks. Oh, so sad. <laughs> I love coach in this class.
we're going to talk about Taylor series, but we're going to talk about, hey, we're just going to cut it off at the second degree. <laughs> so it's not that big of a deal. All right. So let's look at the first problem. To have five, deposit $500 in a bank account at time t, at time t equal to 5, sorry. You're going to use a constant force of interest and you want to know what the account value is at time 12. Now, one of the reasons why it's asking this problem in this fashion, it says starting at time 5 and ending at time 12, is because there's a difference between how we're going to count. Well, there's not really a difference between, but it's going to be a little bit of a trick so they shouldn't say a trick or trap, but you can fall into for varying force of interest that doesn't pop up when you're doing constant force of interest. Okay. So to help us keep that in mind for when we get the varying force of interest on Wednesday, <clears throat> pardon me, scroll, there we go. To keep that in mind, let's not worry about the $500 that we're putting in now. If we were saying on a timeline here, and I put something in at time zero, what would it grow to by the time you get to time five? Under this force of interest idea. What would it grow to by the time you get to time five? It would be P e to the five i, right? or whatever, five, I'll call it delta, because we're using delta for the force of interest, right? Delta is our force of interest. I don't know what that is right now. It's for five years, correct? Agree? Yeah. Okay. And then multiplying by the present value. At that point, we would need to take it and move it forward to time 12, correct? So, I would use an initial starting value of whatever that PE to the 5 delta is, right? That's our initial starting value, correct? But what would I multiply that by now? E to the 7 delta, correct? Because I've got to go from time 5 to time 7, correct? Can you agree with that? So what I mean by this is with worrying about these things is if I want to go from 5 to 7, this 7 here is going to be the difference between those two things. Now later on, we're going to have varying forces of interest where the formula for the force of interest will depend on the time. So instead of starting at 0 necessarily, you might be starting at 5 and 12, and you're going to have to keep track of those as you're going through from one time to the next. But think about this 7 here, it's going kind of for the fact that we went from 5 to 12. And even more to the point, I can think of this as, notice if I would have just moved from P from 0 to 12, I would have done that as P E to the 12 delta, right? Do we agree with that? Notice I could rewrite this E to the 7 delta as e to the 12 delta over e to, oops, e to the 5 delta, right? Doing a division. Right? And this would be a ratio of accumulating factors. This is your accumulating factor from 0 to 12. This is your accumulating factor from 0 to 5. And I can divide them to get my accumulating factor from 5 to 12. And it's this kind of property that we're going to use for the varying force. Okay. I'm only mentioning it now because we're going to see it in more detail in the next period. <clears throat> next class period, I should say. All right. In any event, how does all of this help us with this problem? What we, what's the amount we're starting with? 500. It's at time 5, right? So that 500 is kind of playing this role right here, isn't it? That whole 5 e, or P e to the 5 delta. So what do I need to multiply the 500 by to move it to time 12 if it's already at 5 times 5? E to the 7 delta, right? 
So e to the 7 times 0 .03, uh, 037. And when you put that in your calculator, what do you get? Six forty seven eighty two. So what others got? Cool. Part B says instead of going from time five and pulling it forward to time twelve, we want to go from time five and move it backwards. So if I have this five hundred at time five, now I want to move it backward to time zero. What would we do then? And where are you getting point one eight five? Okay, good. So I would take the 500, I need to di basically discount it backward or go in reverse with our accumulating factor, right? So instead of multiplying, we will divide. So we can do e to the negative 5 times 0 0.037. And again, the 5 is the number of years that we're pulling it backward, that's why it's negative. We're dividing by it, and then multiplying it by the interest, and what do you get in that case? Say 385.91? Okay. No, I, I don't think Sydney got that. Anybody else get that? No, that's not the right answer. That's not right answer? Okay. 415 and like how many? 55. 55? Negative 2,000. <laughs> I don't think that's right. Seven. Ah, oh, got it. I thought I'd mess it up. The present value is so if, if you wanted to accumulate and get five hundred dollars five years in the future, you would need to put in the four fifteen. That's what that gives you. So it's a kind of a I like to think of it as a saving for retirement idea. I've got this goal. I want to get to this value by a certain time. What do I need to put in now? That's how I think of it. Am I okay? <clears throat> All right, just to kind of reinforce the idea with that conversion formula, let's look at number two. Number two says the force of interest is a constant 6%. What's the uh, corresponding annual effective rate? So the nat yeah, natural log of 1 plus i is going to equal 0 0.06, right? <clears throat> That's another one of our formulas that we have. So we've got all of those conversion formulas. You've got what? V is 1 over 1 plus i. D is 1 over, well, the D is also the 1 over or i over 1 plus i. <laughs> So your IV is D and all those things, right? We've got all those different kind of conversion formulas with IVs and Ds. That's another one that we have with the delta. Delta is one natural log of one plus I. So in this case, your I will be E to the 0 0.06 minus one. And what did you get for that? Zero, 0.618. 0, 0.618? Yeah. Okay. And that makes sense that your delta should be smaller than your annual effective interest rate because your annual effective interest rate is assuming a compounding of once per year, whereas your delta is assuming a continuous compound. Does that make sense? Yeah, it was, it's literally each instant it's getting compounded. So it's that limiting idea. All right, we'll do more of these next time as well as get into varying forces of interest. So that'll be chapter five.
When we get through chapter 5, we'll start, we're going to flip to chapter 6, which just starts talking about annuities. And I use the word flip because that's when we're going to go back and look at the videos that are online. That going back to watching the videos in the fourth class will be popping up here shortly. All right, anyway, have a good one. We will see you either in 10 minutes or next time, depending on if you're a probability or not. Yeah. Yep.